we're going to discuss a new statistic for us that is called the sample proportion. However, the sample proportion is based off of a binomial random variable. So it's a gut root that we are already quite familiar with. And we know how to find probabilities with binomial variables. We have that binomial formula. But we're going to make this leap to sample proportions and we'll see how we find probabilities with, well, these sample proportions. So in about 15 minutes or so, we're going to talk about how we can accomplish this blue underlined part, and we'll have to talk about a new type of sampling distribution. But first, I would like to discuss our new topics in a way that may be already familiar. As mentioned, we already know how to compute binomial probabilities using this handy dandy formula. There is another way to compute these probabilities. As we know, we could use R, and because this is the binomial distribution, we could use functions such as D binome, or p binome. And if you feel like downloading that program I've made for you, you could use g binome. And for, I know the built in functions, the inputs are x and p. And d binome is the density function, so that gives you the probability for x whereas p is the cumulative probability up to and including x. However, g binome has inputs, the n and p come first, and then you have to specify the a equals b equals to have that in-between probability. It could also be one-sided. And as a quick recall, remember the binomial random variable we have the two outcomes uh, that we call success or failure. They are disjoint. And as you notice, n and p is always showing up for binomial probabilities because those are the two parameters that define a binomial variable. For instance, in a previous video, we defined a variable that was binomial, we called it y, and it was the number of cats with a particular condition, with a condition, and either a cat had the condition or it didn't, right? And so j was zero successes or one success, two successes. I, I believe that example ended with three successes, but to be more general, I'll just write n. So now, instead of focusing on the number of successes, we're going to focus on the proportion of successes. And so the sample proportion has a little formula. It's very quick and painless. It is just the number of successes, j, over n. So the connection with the binomial variable here is, well, j is in the numerator, and we just divide by n. Pretty, pretty painless. To help establish this connection, I would like to do an example in which we're going to consider both perspectives here. We will use our old perspective, which is binary and number of successes, and then we'll see how we adapt to focus on proportions. So here's a little scroll example. In a town of 48,500 residents, 31,040 are registered to vote. 
if we sample 40 residents, what is the probability that more than 22 are registered? Okay, so here we've got a binary situation. We've got our sample size n, which is 40, and we've got the probability, the event probability, of someone being registered to vote. It wasn't given to us as a direct percentage, but we do know the number of successes out of the population size. So our probability that someone is registered to vote would just be the ratio of those two numbers. And I believe that comes out to 0.64. Pretty cool. So in our question here, what is the probability that more than 22 are registered? So we want to find the probability that y is more than 22. Okay, we're going to use r to help us do this. There's a number of ways we could address this question with the tools we have and in r. And I've got them kind of ready to go, but not quite. For D binome, this one might be the most direct because we're going to tell it to get me the densities, the probabilities, not for 22 successes, because it says greater than 22. So I'll type 23 up through 40. And then I've got N and P. And this would just list all the probabilities. So I'm going to actually sum these and that should get us our solution. If you prefer P binome, this might be less typing, but P binome gives us the cumulative probability. So this, if I typed in 22 as my input here, this would give me probabilities I actually don't want. I want more than 22, not 22 or less. So this gives me the exact opposite or the complement of what I would want. So I would need to do one minus that input for P binome. Lastly, you could use the G binome function. I've already changed my directory. I've got the file downloaded, but I do need to source that file. And that went off without a hitch. And G binome, I need to do N, P, and then the values A equals B equals that we need to input would be 23 through the end of 40. Now, when I run all these, we should get the same solution for every single one. G binome will get me a graph, however. Let's watch it whip. Approximately 0.8463. Ah, yes, the two D binome and P binome gave me the same solution. Let's make sure G binome corresponds. Indeed, it does. And I love this graphical visual as well. So we know the solution to this question. We have the tools to answer it. I'm going to write it down and expand upon it. So we would call this an exact solution because there was no real approximation to the method behind finding this probability. This new method of ours is going to be, as mentioned, instead of focusing on 22 or 23 successes, we're going to focus on the proportion of successes. But a proportion is a sample statistic. And so we need to know how this statistic is distributed. Enter in the sampling distribution of the sample proportion, which we call P with a hat. 
just like we did with previous videos in this chapter, we're going to discuss this theoretical framework where we're considering all possible samples, right? It's, it's theoretical indeed because you don't go and collect infinite number of samples. And each one of those samples, you would be counting how many successes occurred and then getting a proportion for each sample, right? And so we're discussing how are all possible sample proportions distributed. We would love it if these proportions formed a normal distribution because we really know how to work with those. So discussing the shape, center, and spread here, we're basically talking about when can the shape be approximately normal. And well, that is satisfied if both n times p is at least 5 and n1 minus p is at least 5. So this is the expected number of successes, or the mean, and this is the expected number of failures. And if they are both at least 5 and then we can anticipate that this distribution is approximately normal. So we know that shape very well. I would label this P with a hat. This shape improves in its normality-ness as N increases. So this improves as N increases. A natural next statement about normal distributions is, where is it centered? What is the mean of all of those sample proportions? P hat. Well, just like we saw when we did the means of the means is the mean. <laughs> this is just P. What is P? Oh, well, it's this P. <laughs> it's this P, right? P is the population proportion or the event probability that we saw with that voting example, population pro portion. And just to distinguish here, P with a hat is the sample proportion. So remember when we did in the previous video, we said the mean of the sample means is the population mean. That's exactly what we're saying here, except as applied to proportions. So I will put the letter P here. The next interesting thing to ask about this normal distribution would be, what is the spread of it? How can we quantify the standard deviation of the sample proportions? And when we did this with the mean, remember it was sigma over square root of n? Well, it it's actually very similar to that here, but because we are working from a binomial perspective, we're based off of a binomial, the standard deviation is P times one minus P all over N, and then the whole thing is in the square root. Where on earth did this come from? This comes from the standard deviation of a binomial random variable, where that is n p 1 minus p, all square rooted. But the connection here with proportions, remember, is just division by n. So if you took this whole thing, 
divide by pink n, and you do a little arithmetic simplification, you will arrive at this simpler statement over here on the left. So these are the qualities of the sampling distribution of all possible sample proportions. It is based off of a binomial variable. And now that we know that sample proportions under certain circumstances can follow a normal distribution approximately, then we can find probabilities associated with sample proportions. We're going to do that by, because we're in a normal world, we can use a z-score to help us find probabilities. We'll also see how we do this in R. Recall when we first looked at z-scores, the very first formula we saw looked like this. y minus mu over sigma. This is the general structure of a z-score, and it got amended slightly when we focused on means, because we put a bar on that y, but we needed to consider the spread of sample means, and, well, we put that square root of n down there. Same thing here. We're going to use a z-score formula, and it's going to have this general structure. However, it needs to be amended to apply not to means, but to proportions. This z-score is the value of interest, that would be sample proportion, that's what we are finding a probability in regards to, minus the mean of sample proportions. We will simplify that in a moment. And in the denominator, the standard deviation of sample proportions. So this is the formula, but I do not like formulas that make you reference other formulas. I will rewrite this so it's a little bit more explicit. Sample proportion minus population proportion all over big square root p, 1 minus p, over n, all up in that denominator. I'll put this one in a box circle there. Let's go back to our voter registration example from earlier. I copy pasted the highlights here, and now we're going to answer this question, but this time let's use this perspective of focusing on the proportion of successes instead of the number of successes. So we already know what n and p are. n, p, got it. What we need to translate here is the sample proportion, p with a hat. Because it's from a sample, it is the number of successes 22 over the sample size. So that is 0.55. That is what we are going to insert to our value right up here. And we know all the other values. So let's plug all these in and we're going to do a z-score for this sample proportion. 22 out of 40 voters, it's, that's 55% of the sample. That is a little bit less than the population proportion of registered voters, which is 0.64. So that's going to be a negative z-score. In the denominator, we've got P 
0.64 times 1 minus 0.64 over n. That was the sample size of 40. And pardon me for, I want to perform this subtraction, and particularly I want to do this standard deviation denominator port part just to, so it's really crisp for us. Okay, I have all the values that I could want here. I wanted this denominator value. You'll see why in a moment, but I'm gonna retranscribe this into my writing space. If we're going to use the Z table, recall that we need to round to the second decimal place. So I should actually round this to negative 1.19. Negative 1.19. With my Z table out, I'm on the negative side. Negative 1.19 one nine should get me to the value point one one seven zero okay so this is extracted from the z table point one one seven zero now that's not the answer because remember this is a greater than question the z table only gives us less than probabilities, so we need to take the complement and we get the solution of 0.8830. So this is actually an approximation to our original question. This is the probability that p hat is more than 0.55. In our solution, about 0.88, this is an approximation. Contrast with the exact method, because this was exact, because the variable inherently was a binomial variable, and we used the binomial formula to compute this. But here, this is an approximation, this solution here because we used a normal curve distribution to approximate a binary binomial distribution. So normal curves are continuous, but a binomial variable is discrete. So there is a little bit of a translation error there. That's why this is an approximation. How good was this approximation? Well, you can do the subtraction here. What I neglected to do several moments ago, intentionally, was we should verify that the approximation method was suitable. We should verify that NP is at least 5 and N1 minus P is at least 5. That is what allows us to use this Z score method. So this allows us to use the normal distribution approximation method, this method. I think I see that this is going to work out just fine because 40 was our sample size n and p was 0.64. That is about a 25-ish and so that's definitely more than 5, yes. And then the other check, n times 1 minus 0.64, that is about a 
just shy of 15, which is also bigger than five. So we met the requirements that allow us to get a reasonably good approximation using this method as opposed to the binomial formula. I also want to look at this image that we created at the beginning of the video in which we've got the binomial distribution for this scenario displayed in front of us. And it is not a perfect bell shape, but it is reasonably bell shaped, which is why we met these uh, requirements, because these parameters in the binomial distribution result in a probability mass function that looks bell shaped. Now, without a calculator, without R, this isn't so bad. The binomial formula up here, if we didn't use R, we would still be working on this problem. So this is an approximation, and the cost of that approximation is that it's easier. How would ha we have done this in R? Let's see. In R, well, we would need to use, this is a normal distribution that we're implementing here, so we would use p-norm. And remember, the input for p-norm is x mean standard deviation. For us, we need the probability to the right, so we would need to type 1 minus p norm. Our p hat was 0 0.55, 0 0.55, right? That came from our p hat up here. The mean was 0.64, and our standard deviation, that's this big square rooted mess here, that's why I wanted to compute it. It's about 0.07. I'll just actually type the whole square root so I don't have any rounding error. I'll just type the whole square root, 0.64, 1 minus 0.64 over 40. That will reduce the chance that I have any rounding error. So when we do this in R, this should get us to our solution of 0.883. So let's go check it out in R. I've already got my square rooted amount here, so I will copy paste that. And I wanna do one minus. I've got it all typed in. It should be about 0.88. That's excellent. Now this was a little off because of the issues with the Z table, right? In the Z table, we had to do a little rounding. So there was a little offness there, but we are pretty much right on point with 0.88 there. So the mean standard deviation of this sample proportion distribution was used in the normal command here, the p-norm, to find a cumulative probability. So we're integrating a lot of new concepts, probability distributions for a new statistic, the sample proportion, but we're doing it in the context of hopefully some familiar concepts. We'll call it a day on that video.